Today we're going to talk about arrangement of grid points. So when we solve equations, say for uh, the for our atmospheric model, uh, we, we need to predict u, v, w, uh, velocity components, uh, pressure, temperature, potential temperature, and so on, water vapor, cloud water, and uh, we have grid. And uh, it's two-dimensional grid, but let's, let's say that it's two-dimensional here. So uh, uh, we could define those variables uh, differently. Um, uh, we could define them all at the same grid points, like we assume that say U, V, and W are computed here, and also pressure is computed in the same grid points, temperature, and so on. That one grid arrangement, you know, and in different grid points we have also have the same arrangement. That's one way. Or, or we could uh, arrange them slightly differently. Say we can assume that your velocities are computed here, u, v, uh, w at, gr at grid cell corners. But pressure can be computed, say, here in the center. And temperature can be computed. Uh, all scalars can be put in the center and so on. Uh, we, we can do even um, more differently. We can assume that, say, Velocities U defined defined on uh, this grid cell sides, V defined here, and pressure say defined in the middle. So there are various arrangements, and uh, there are advantages and disadvantages uh, to each of these arrangements. Um, so uh, and actually the why why we would do something like that. Like um, it, it depends on the problems that we solve. Like for, uh, for in our field, it's very important to conserve uh, conservation law should be obeyed, such as uh, say conservation of mass of energy. And some of those grids actually, uh, it's much easier to enforce conservation laws that we're going to talk about in uh, probably next lecture. Um, than the other uh, grid arrangements. For example, it's very difficult to um, make conservation law work on this grid, and it's very easy to, to use, for example, this grid, and so on. Um, and what, what we're going to talk about today is how this arrangement of uh, grid points uh, affects propagating properties of w waves. Because basically what we solve when we solve our equations um, of fluid motion, we basically solving for a bunch of waves. Um, you know, any solution can be represented as a superposition of waves. And all this flow um, at certain scale is all bunch of waves. Of course, uh, um, when we talk about clouds, they're more kind of vertical, vertical uh, it's more like vertical flow. So, but even in that case, if you look very uh, kind of zoom in into cloud, uh, you will see those waves uh, like uh, basically that represent turbulence of this chaotic uh, flow on small scales and so on. So it's all about waves. So let's uh, consider some model of waves, dynamical waves that, and then we explore some different grid arrangements and see how this arrangement affects the solution relative to uh, analytical or exact solution that uh, we, we can actually consider in this case using very simple model of a flow. And that model is very popular in dynamics, in dynamical meteorology and oceanography and you all familiar. Those of you who are meteorologists and, uh, or atmospheric scientists and took some dynamics class of course, uh, of course, know about that model. It's so-called shallow water model. So let's uh, uh, let's consider the shallow water model, which is very good model for atmospheric or oceanic flow in general. And when we talk about some theoretical issues related to that, so shallow water, uh, basically, that's what name implies. It's a, a layer of water. Why it's water? Because water is kind of, uh, um, we assume that uh, the, the fluid is incompressible. So um, 
that water is indeed uh, more or less incompressible for our purposes at least. So, uh, um, so you have this water layer and then you have some average height, let's call it H, so this is depth of water, and then you have departure from that average height and we call it H small h, so this is departure. And, um, and usually we assume that H is much smaller than H. So just surface, surface waves. Uh, and uh, so we assume that velocity here is all because it's because of this. There is no profile of velocity, vertical profile. All the uh, velocity is kind of moving uh, uh, is the same for the whole layer, for the whole depth of this layer. So this is u, so let's say, it's velocity. And um, so this is a very simple system and uh, you can show, you actually derive shallow water equations from original uh, equations that describe atmospheric model for ocean is kind of uh, right away, uh, you can, because ocean consists of water, right? So very shallow ocean. But for atmosphere, it's a similar uh, equations can be derived. So uh, uh, it's making some assumptions. So this is pretty universal model. And for one dimensional case, let's con uh, consider one dimensional case and also a linear case, which means that we won't consider this uh, advection uh, of, uh, of velocity by, by itself. So those kind of uh, uh, non-linear terms will be thrown away. We assume that the initially the basic state of is uh, calm, so there is no mean velocity. In that case, and, and mean height is constant, does not depend on x or y. So in that in that case, um, you can write very uh, simple one-dimensional. Say, cons we, we, let's consider one-dimensional case. In that case, uh, we can write uh, shallow water equations, or oh, also I forgot to mention, we assume that it's rotated. So the fluid is actually subjected to rotation uh, with some frequency f, uh, which is Coriolis parameter, right? So rotating shallow water, water equations. So we consider this 2D case first, as the simplest one. So for 2D case, we have the following equation. We have a rate of change of velocity, and velocity here is only a function of time and distance, x, uh, plus Coriolis force, where v, so u, v are components, of wind, so u is wind in this direction and v is wind in that direction, plus g dh dx equal to zero. So this is pressure gradient force or just when you have uh, some h here, so some wave. It's actually, of course, uh, hydrostatically create this force that wants to move a little bit away from that bulge. So if you have this bulge, it creates this force that actually tries to smear it out so that it will accelerate liquid away from it and so on. So uh, G is gravity, gravity acceleration. H is height relative to mean depth h. And uh, so a uh, similar equation we have for V component because of Coriolis force, but there is no pressure because we, it's two dimensional problem. So we assume that there is symmetry in that direction. Uh, all the derivatives in y in that perpendicular direction to the board actually equal to zero. And dh dt is this continuity equation and just conservation of mass that looks like the following. 
будет надевай. So basically, this one is says that if uh, H is reduced, it, it generates some convergence or divergence of flow here. So this is just a conservation of mass. So this is our so-called continuity equation. And of course, I'm not going to. Uh, I, I was not. I just wrote this equation. I didn't derive them, but actually, you can thoroughly derive them if you. And you probably have done that in one of your dynamics classes. So it's continuity equation. And those are uh, two are momentum equations. So this uh, very simple system uh, rotating a shallow water and uh, so it generates lots of waves and those waves move with some uh, speeds and so we need some uh, let's drive some dispersion relation for it. Uh, this, uh, dispersion relation is uh, basically how uh, wave speed or frequency and frequency depend on uh, wave number or wavelengths of waves. For that, we, uh, as usual, in this kind of analysis for all linear systems, we use Fourier harmonics uh, that we used before. So just basically those sine functions uh, with of different wavelengths. And um, so uh, we consider solution. in the form that uh, u, v, h as a vector equals to some amplitudes times e, e this uh, complex, complex uh, exponent here, so wave number uh, x minus omega t we used that in our analysis before of stability and so on. So M is a wave number. And this is frequency, omega is frequency. So M equals to 2 pi divided by wavelength lambda. So uh, uh, now we need to derive this term M and omega cannot be independent. Uh, they cannot be arbitrary. And there is a relationship between them. So omega is a function, omega is a function of m, and this uh, functional dependence is called dispersion equation. So we need to derive dispersion equation for this system, and it is relatively easy to do. You just substitute this solution to this uh, set of equations, and uh, if you do that, you will arrive to the following um, matrix minus i omega minus f i m g here minus i omega f um, f is nothing. Um, oh, sorry, this is not correct. It's my. Uh, it's I F minus I omega. Yeah, that's more like it. And here is I M H. Here is zero. And here minus I omega again. This is matrix multiplied by uh, U, V, W, uh, I, mean, I mean H, amplitudes equals to zero. So this is just matrix, matrix form of uh, system of equation that uh, is you, you get if you substitute this solution into this uh, system of equations. And of course, from linear algebra, you, you know that in order for this set of linear equations that have zero on the right hand side, for it to have non-trivial solution, non-trivial meaning that trivial solution is u, v, and w equal to zero, then anything multiplied by zero is zero, of course. So outside of, of trivial solution, this is how mathematicians call it, outside of trivial solution, in order for this system, for solution to exist, 
we need that the determinant, determinant of this matrix should be equal to zero. And you, of course, probably remember how to determine, uh, how to uh, find determinant of, um, of a 3 by 3 matrix. You just multiply this diagonal plus product of these three elements and product from these three elements and minus and this product of this diagonal uh, minus this product of these three elements and then product of these three elements. Remember that rule? So it's kind of, and if you do that, you will arrive to third order equation. Which looks like the following, that uh, omega cube minus m square omega gh minus omega uh, f square equal to zero. So this third order equation, but fortunately uh, it's, uh, it's easy to solve because first solution is omega equal to zero, which is trivial solution and we won't consider it. And then which is left is the following solution, omega square equals to f square plus m square gh. So this is dispersion relation. Omega is a function of m. So from that we can of course uh, find uh, uh, speed of waves. That's why dispersion relation should exist because omega related to m uh, and c speed equals to so c speed equal to it, speed is defined omega divided by m. So from that you see that the speed equals to f square. Uh, well, let's f square divided by uh, uh, m square plus g h square root. So now, um, if fluid is not rotating, no rotation, then there is no Coriolis force and f equals to zero. From that, we see that that then c equals to square root of g h. So you see that in a case when there is no rotation, the wave speed does not depend on, on a wave number or wavelength. So all waves travel at the same speed in shallow, on shallow, in shallow water equals to square root of gh. So gravity times depth of the fluid square root. So there is no dispersion of waves uh, if your shallow water is not rotating. But if it does rotate, then you see that your speed starts being function of m through this rotation. So different waves of different wavelengths will travel at different speeds. So the shortest waves, remember that m equals to 2 pi divided by lambda. So when lambda goes to 0, approaches 0, very short waves, m approaches infinity which means that you divide by infinity, so this term becomes small and we see that short waves travel with speed gh. So they basically, for short waves, there is no rotation, they don't feel it. Which just makes sense, like we're short waves, like when we're standing on surface of Earth, Earth is rotating, we don't feel it, we, we see no, like we, we look at our pool, uh, 
uh, and uh, make some waves in it, we see no effect of rotation on our waves in the pool. They all kind of, and, and we don't feel rotation, right? Because we, all our world is kind of s is small, all our surroundings, we are small. So we don't really feel rotation, except for like over a long time, we see that the sun is actually moving somewhere. Um, so that makes sense. So sh short waves don't feel rotation. And, uh, but long waves do. So what's, what's the scale when rotation actually becomes important? And for that, if you look at that, let's divide it by f square. So we have omega square divided by f square equals to 1 plus m square g h divided by f square. So uh, the term with f on is this guy. So what uh, if we look at this, m square units are inverse length squared. So it means that this guy <laughs> has units of some length squared. So g h divided by f squared. Let's take square root. Then it has units of length, it's distance. And this thing is called, this quantity is called Rossby radius. So Rossby radius. So we have um, uh, here we have terms m square r Rossby radius squared. So it's equals to uh, four pi square divided by lambda squared times Rossby radius squared. So it's four pi squared Rossby radius divided by lambda squared. So now this term becomes important. Uh, and become large when, so when Rossby radius or lambda, when lambda is much smaller than Rossby radius, what's going to happen? It means that Rossby radius over lambda is much bigger than one. In that case, rotation, you see here, uh, this term, this thing becomes very large, and uh, uh, so uh, so what what does it mean? It means that uh, this term becomes much bigger than one. So then you have that omega square over f square is approximately equals to m square g h over f square, and f square cancel. So you see that now omega. We just get a uh, um, dispersion relation for no rotational case. So basically, these waves don't feel rotation. So we conclude that for waves for which Rossby radius or lambda is much smaller than Rossby radius, so for perturbations for waves that are much smaller than Rossby radius of so called Rossby radius of deformation, uh, those waves don't feel rotation. And opposite, when uh, lambda is much greater than Rossby radius, then Rossby radius divided by lambda is much smaller than one, then this term is drops out basically. And you see that all your waves are oscillating with frequency, with inertial frequency. So they all become, inertial frequency means Coriolis fr uh, frequency. So it's basically, they just uh, oscillate with frequency of rotation and they don't care about dynamics, so they're basically like frozen into rotation. Dynamics is given by this GH, it's propagation, it's uh, kind of all this physics of propagation, it's completely gone. So long waves don't feel dynamics, all they feel is just rotation. And uh, uh, so that's the difference. So it, uh, in uh, physical terms, what it means, physical meaning is that Rossby radius of deformation determines this regime when uh, uh, for perturbations bigger than Rossby radius of deformation, uh, rotation is very important, and every th the flow becomes so-called in some quasi-geostrophic balance. It means that pressure gradient terms are compensated by Coriolis for, uh, terms. So Coriolis force is uh, equal to pressure gradient uh, uh, terms. So you have all these, say, cyclones, then this quasi-geostrophic uh, balance. Uh, 
And for perturbations that are small, it's not the case. Uh, they don't really, Coriolis force is not important. So pressure gradient actually directly pushing uh, the fluid it makes it accelerating while in, um, uh, for very large waves it's not actually the case because pressure gradient is actually compensated by Coriolis force. So you of course know all that from your dynamics class, but uh, just to remind you. So now our goal is to uh, see how grid arrangement preserves this kind of quantities. So for this, uh, for these equations, let's, uh, so this is our um, analytical solution uh, that we, our dispersion relation, this is n, here is omega square divided by f square. <coughs> so here is one, this is very long waves approaching one, so they approach here, but of course, on grid, we get it's finite. We cannot, uh, even on Earth, it's not infinite wavelengths. So, but from some scale, it's going to look like parabola. So this is our uh, analytical solution. <coughs> so let's see now. Um, how this dispersion relation would look for different grid arrangements. So we now uh, make, instead of calculus, we make algebra. So we have discrete system, discrete space. So let's consider first the so-called uh, grid A. Grid A, uh, such that so we have uh, x coordinate here, here we have grid points. And uh, we compute all variables in the same grid points. So u, v, and h all computed at the same grid points. And uh, we have indices, k as usual as before, k, k minus one, k plus one. So now let's uh, consider uh, our shallow water equations, but we won't consider time derivative. We want to consider uh, like a, because it's arrangement in space. So we pres uh, time derivative will preserve in an in analytical form, in calculus form. We can always replace it with our favorite uh, time scheme that we uh, considered before. But uh, for now, we just consider without. Uh, any time derivative, find the difference derivative in time. So it's continuous derivative in time. So uk dt plus f v k uh, plus g. And now this is pressure gradient term. And we use central differences. So um, dh d, dx, we consider second order accurate approximation. So this minus this. So h k plus one minus h k minus one divided by two delta x equal to zero. And d v k d t equals to minus f u k and d h d t equals to or plus h and here a d u dx, so it's just central differences again, uk plus 1 minus uk minus 1 divided by 2 delta x equals to 0. So this is our finite difference analog of our shallow water equations that we use uh, to solve this uh, shallow water, rotating shallow water equations on, uh, on a grid uh, numerically. So one thing that it's nice to have this grid for computing Coriolis force. Why? Because u and v are collocated. So for u, you need v and it's the same point. So for u in this grid point, you have already v in this grid point. Imagine that v was in some other grid point as we consider some other example. Uh, then you would have problems. Then you would have to probably interpolate on the grid to get v in location of u and vice versa to get u 
in location where V is. So the only thing that we used, uh, so we have no interpolations here, we just use basically everything is very nicely computed. We use central differences, second order uh, derivatives in uh, points where, where we need uh, derivatives. So everything is nice. So now we consider um, our uh, waves, and in this case they are slightly different because now our x x becomes k delta x, so that's the only thing that we need to plug in in our uh, wave equation. I mean our solution, this is our solution, equals to u v h with tilde amplitudes and e i m and instead of x we have of course k delta x minus omega t. And then after that uh, uh, we just what we do we substitute them here the only derivatives that we have analytically to be taken is these guys so they produce i omega again terms I'm not going to do that but if you do all this you arrive uh, to the following uh, dispersion relation so this one is analytical one This is the correct one. And now on grid A, we will get the following dispersion relation that omega squared divided by F squared equals to 1 plus GH over F squared. So far so good. Here M squared. Mm, it's always the same. But the problem is it's multiplied, this guy multiplied by sine square m uh, m delta x divided by m delta x squared that's a bummer so so now let's uh, make a sanity check if we move from uh, uh, algebra to calculus, our delta x should go to zero. So we reduce our grid size more and more and more. And so delta x goes to zero, so sine of x divided by x. And uh, remember that when x goes to zero, uh, you probably remember it from calculus, using L'Hopital's rule, if you remember that. So sine x divided by x limit x goes to zero you cannot take it because uh, like directly because this one goes to zero this one goes to zero but you divide by zero it's kind of what to do you use L'Hopital's rule so you take derivative of both things test to limit derivative of sine is cosine divided by derivative of x is one and then x goes to zero cosine goes to one so it's equal to one so limit of this sine x divided by x in the limit of x going to 0 equals to 1. And from that we see that this term, when delta x going to 0, becomes 1, and we recover our um, analytical dispersion relation. So, yes indeed, uh, that's, that's good. That's sanity check. So how our dispersion relation then look like with this function in there, equivalent to this one. So if m omega squared divided by f squared, 1. It actually looks like the following. So our m is actually here cannot be infinite. Right? Because our shortest waves are two delta x waves. It cannot be shortest. And our m, the shortest one, remember, it's pi over delta x. It's uh, two delta x waves. So if we, if we look at this, uh, pi divided by delta x, it means that uh, m delta x equals to pi divided by delta x by delta x, so it's equals to pi. Sine of pi equals to zero. So we see that this guy becomes zero 
for two delta x wave and it's one. So now it means that for this two delta x waves it's zero at maximum you can take derivative and show that maximum of this function uh, maximum with respect to m for different m's is for actually four, four delta x waves. Those are four delta x. And you of course remember from if you uh, looked at the lecture on nonlinear instability, those two waves are actually pesky waves that create nonlinear instability. But for, for that, the, 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 the relationship would look something like that. So this thing looks nothing like this thing. So we see our obvious choice of a grid, just simple grid, when all our variables are located in the same grid point, produces completely bizarre result, incorrect. So basically what we have here, that our two delta x waves, they have the whole term, this guy disappears. So they behave, the shortest wave, as if they are the longest waves. Remember that longest waves don't feel dynamics, all they feel is rotation. Here is the same way, two delta x waves don't feel dynamics, all they feel is rotation. How come? They're supposed to be, supposed not to feel rotation at all. Remember that short waves they don't feel kind of rotation, right? So they don't, it's not supposed to feel rotation, but they do. And moreover, they actually behave exact, exactly like as if it's very long waves. And why is so? It's because of this, uh, when we computed these derivatives for pressure gradient term, this is what creates dynamics. This is what pushing velocity, right? You have duk, dt, and you have this term on the right hand side. I mean, if you put it on the right hand side. So there is plus periodic term. So let's look at this term. So for two delta x waves, so what's two delta x waves on the grid? You have something like that. Um, this is two delta x waves. So it has kind of like that. So now, when we compute derivative in this grid point, you take this value minus this value, and this distance is 2 delta x, and values for 2 delta x wave waves in these points is the same. So this term equals to 0 for 2 delta x waves. So you see, it doesn't, 2 delta x waves don't see pressure gradient. All they see is Coriolis force, which is no problem, it's here F, V, K. There is no averaging involved here. So basically, in a way, you average your H by subtracting this for two delta x waves, they look like averages, and average for two delta x waves is zero. There is no gradient for two delta, delta x waves. That's why two delta x waves don't see uh, don't see dynamics, only Coriolis. And for delta x waves, because they are very short, they also kind of similar, show similar behavior, but uh, for them it's actually opposite. Now they actually see dynamics very well, more than they, 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 uh, they may be so even supposed to. But, but for shorter waves, they here, behavior, well, are kind of exaggerated here. So for shorter waves, this is what this behavior is. So this line. So uh, for short, uh, for, I mean, not for short, for longer waves, the behavior is kind of similar to this behavior. You see, it's increasing with uh, m. But it's probably di uh, uh, distorted around four delta x waves. So the, the conclusion that we make from this, uh, this A grid, or when all variables are collocated, it produces correct solution for very long waves. 
but very incorrect solution for very short waves. So uh, we see that uh, uh, two delta x waves uh, <coughs> don't actually feel dynamics here. <coughs> so if your two delta x waves are really so it's the, all, all the feel uh, feel rotation, but rotation is a very slow thing, and so if you have uh, say your two delta x uh, scales or very short scales are on scale of say clouds, like a few kilometer scale, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Uh, it's not what you worry about here. But if you talking about this uh, model with uh, some weather forecasting model with relatively coarse grid and your grid spacing is kind of not very small, then those two delta x waves, they basically don't participate in any quasi-geostrophic adjustment. So for models when the delta, delta x is in the order of Rossby radius of deformation, that's very bad. But uh, for, uh, but when delta x kind of uh, not that uh, that particularly large, very small, when the rotation can be ignored anyway, then it's it's not big deal. The problem with this grid not only that it doesn't that two delta x waves don't par uh, participate in uh, any uh, in any adjustment process because they don't see any pressure gradient uh, term force. But also uh, because it's very difficult to enforce conservation law of this on, on this grid that we're going to talk about next. So overall, grid A is, is bad. So uh, let's consider another grid quickly. Grid B. Grid B, <coughs> and in that grid, we uh, uh, consider U and V in, in, in collocated, but H is staggered. So you see, it's uh, staggered relative to U and V. So what's immediately you would see the advantage uh, for so u and v collocated so it's easy to compute Coriolis force right for u and v it's right there the same grid point so no averaging is involved and also if you want to compute gradient it's right there no averaging also involves it this for for pressure gradient in this grid point you have h in this point minus minus h in this point so your g d h d x term becomes g h k plus one half so this is k k minus one k plus one and here we have k plus one half k minus one half so it's it's kind of weird index index instead of being an integer it's uh, now uh, not integer but it just for uh, for in this case, it's it's we just use it as x equal to for velocities it's k delta x, and for it's a, for u and v, and for x h it's equal k plus one half delta x something like that. So, so but anyway, you have h k plus one half k k minus one half divided by delta x. So now, dispersion relation for this scheme looks like 1 plus g h over f square m square. And here we have sine square m delta x over 2 divided by m delta x over 2 squared. So the difference between A and B grids now, that in A grid we had M delta X and here we have M delta X over 2. And that's actually a big difference because now then if for shortest two delta X waves, M equals to pi over delta X, so sine uh, becomes pi over 2, which is 1, uh, and here is also. So it does not disappear now, this term does not disappear for two delta X waves. 
as the dispersion relation looks like like the following it looks something like that and this is analytical or exact and this is our dispersion this guy so you see it's a little bit off but uh, well it's maybe not like that it's like so it's uh, uh, off but it's in the right direction it's much better than this kind of what we had before so it's much better so it's better so grid B is definitely better than grid A for this dispersion property See, it's such a little change that we made creates this very strong response. So you see, it does matter how you locate your grid points. Um, so there are other arrangements that uh, we could consider. For example, we could consider, but they more uh, uh, more kind of make sense on uh, in two dimensions. So let's consider two dimensional case. Of course, we're not gonna. Uh, derive equations for the dimension, although it's relatively easy to do too. So in 3D, we may have considered some other grid locations, arrangements. So uh, for 3D case, uh, our shallow equation is just have derivatives in Y added. So we have du dt plus fv minus g dh dx. Then we have dv dt minus f u and plus here minus, plus g dh dy and dh dt plus h du dx plus dv dy equals to zero. And so uh, if we use our solution as uh, u v h equals to u, v, h and here we have just a two-dimensional solution which is m, x and plus n, y and minus omega t so we just add n, y so it's another, uh, another dimension there and then our uh, solution here dispersion relation will look similar, very similar as before, but it just instead of uh, m squared, you have m squared plus n squared. That's all. So it's quite uh, quite similar and uh, uh, our dispersion now relation becomes two-dimensional graph. So we have m, here we have n, and it looks like like so uh, kind of circles uh, and values here like uh, say one two three four five six so this is how so if you um, make a cross section for n equal to zero let's say two-dimensional then you have this kind of parabola and but here like for two dimensions you have something like that so this is our kind of analytical solution for 2D. This personal relation should look like that. So uh, let's consider different grids and uh, and those are historically because uh, the first person who actually did this kind of analysis for two dimensions was uh, Arakawa, Akio Arakawa, pretty famous uh, modeler, uh, you know, one of the pioneers of uh, uh, modeling of atmospheric uh, flows. Uh, uh, he just uh, recently, relatively recently, uh, retired uh, completely um, from uh, from the field. Uh, he's like close to 90 years old, um, and um, he he lives in uh, I believe in uh, uh, well he used to be professor at uh, UCLA. I uh, don't know if he moved to somewhere else, but uh, used to be professor in uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles. So uh, uh, for that case, uh, for grid A, let's consider grid A, our kind of uh, collocated grid. So in two dimensions, it would look, long, uh, would look something like that. 
<coughs> so you have u, v and h everywhere defined say in these corners of the cells. U, V, H, everywhere. So for that, if we look at this dispersion relation, it would look like instead of this, it would look something like that. Here would be numbers like here is like five, here is four, three, two, so something like this, which means that you see uh, for very for low, for short waves we have basically the same behavior as uh, for long wave as we saw before for two delta x waves. So here you have. 2 delta x and 2 delta y waves here and here, so they kind of the same, behave the same. So they have the same, this drawback that you 2 delta x waves, uh, so 2 delta x and 2 delta y waves don't participate, participate in dynamics. See only rotation. And so as a result, uh, there is no way to get rid of them. They basically stuck around, they just, you know, move around, they do nothing. They feel no rotation whatsoever, then nothing is actually disturbing them. They just basically just, if you generated them through nonlinear uh, process, they just stick around. So a lot of noise, of two delta x noise. So this is uh, not good, that's another con. Um, the pro is that it's simple. It's simple. Um, Coriolis force uh, can be very easily uh, computed. But this one is actually make it very impractical. Uh, it, it doesn't produce uh, good solutions for relatively coarse grids. So if you have coarse grid, like for a casting uh, grid, it used to be like, I don't know, or, or, or climate model grid, say with grid spacing of 100 kilometers or so, that's uh, it's close to Rossby radius of deformation. Rossby radius of deformation is like uh, something in mid latitude, something like order of like thousand kilometers. So it's too close to that. So those two delta x waves become kind of important. Uh, you cannot just throw them away because then you have even coarser grids. So you actually need two delta x waves to produce some of your features of your solution. Uh, you cannot just throw them away because then you effectively you're throwing away your grid out your resolution out so but those two delta x waves they kind of uh, completely incorrect they have completely incorrect behavior which affects your longer waves as well eventually through these nonlinear interactions so this grid is bad overall so grid b so why I mention Arakawa, by the way, because this classification grids A, B, C, and D, and so on, it's came, uh, they called Arakawa, it, because Arakawa kind of first uh, used that classification, uh, that's why it's called, they call Arakawa. Arakawa, say, A grid, it's usually A grid, Arakawa B grid, so you may see like, See in literature the same classification. Uh, we used Arakawa C grid, and everybody knows basically what it means. So this is a big grid, Arakawa big grid, and in that grid uh, we have H's in the middle, but U and V in corners. So advantage, uh, advantage um, or pro and cons. Pro careerless force is easy. Force 
is easy. So no averaging involved to compute Coriolis force because U and V are collocated. Uh, now, in our two-dimensional case, uh, it was best grid, right? Uh, because if we could compute this pressure gradient across uh, uh, components of wind without averaging. But here it's not that is the case in two dimensions because for you to compute u, you actually need to average your h. So you compute u and v in this point. You need to take your h's, compute them in this point, and then similar in this point, and then compute gradient in x. And to compute gradient in y, uh, similarly, first you average in this direction, in x, and then you compute derivative. So now you compute, uh, you average your pressure before applying gradient, before computing pressure gradient. So this is big con and it affects uh, this dispersion uh, relation. So it's, uh, uh, so con pressure gradient is computed from averaged height field. It's that. 2 delta x uh, don't feel dynamics but again. So it's similar to like uh, A grid. But uh, the advantage, uh, but it's not, but not as bad. It's not as bad. You, you basically can tell that it's not too uh, bad because in 2D it's actually not that bad at all. So um, um, let's call it fairly, fairly, uh, fairly, uh, fairly good. So it's kind of uh, okay, but not still agreed, but it's okay. So now let's consider uh, two more grids before we're done. This is uh, the most important grid in our field, I would claim, is Arakawa C grid. And it's very important grid for, for models actually. Many, many, many models use this Arakawa C grid. What's Arakawa C grid? It's uh, when, uh, <coughs> so you compute your H's like in uh, Arakawa B grid in the middle. But remember, the dis 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 disadvantage was that in order to compute pressure gradient, you need to average. So why not then put velocities into the points where pressure gradient can be directly computed without averaging? So to compute for V, we need pressure gradient in this direction and to compute u, you need pressure gradient in this direction. So why not put u's in here, v's in here? And then there is no averaging involved when you compute pressure gradient. Great. But there is one drawback. Now, how you compute uh, Coriolis parameter? So in order to compute Coriolis, say in this point where u is defined, you need v, and v's are all over the place but not in here. So you need to average these four v, v's into this grid point. So you just find, say, geometric average of these four. So Coriolis force should be average. So pro no pressure gradient averaging. So no pressure gradient averaging. 
that's very very good property the main cone is that Coriolis force force requires averaging and that can be bad why uh, because one of the properties of Coriolis force fundamental property physical um, is that it does not create new kinetic energy all 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 Coriolis force does is to rotate the flow the change velocity direction but not amplitude so uh, Coriolis force conserves energy kinetic energy and by averaging you need to make sure that it's the case otherwise you may generate some uh, artificial uh, generation or destruction of kinetic energy so that you need to be careful about that well fortunately just geometric average is actually kind of the accomplished that so it's not a big problem but um, for but it affects um, because of averaging it actually affects some dispersion properties but not that bad um, so that is that is not big k big deal when your Rossby radius is much bigger than your grid spacing let's say if you have cloud model uh, your uh, grid spacing can be just few kilometers couple kilometers and Rossby radius is thousands of kilometers so even so your career force is small anyway so if you could even make some mistake error by averaging all these velocity components to compute your Coriolis force it's not a big deal because that those uh, those terms are small anyway uh, in small scales so that's why this grid is very popular for cloud models so but not for not big deal for uh, when delta x is much much smaller than Rossby radius cloud models like Worf and others so that's why this, this scheme it, it also has other cons nice properties it's very easy to write uh, mass conservation for these schemes like if you define mass in the grid cell in this grid point then you can easily compute fluxes because you see all these velocity components kind of looking perpendicular to uh, sides of this cell and it's very easy to compute fluxes and then make it kind of conservation of that thing so that's another reason why people like uh, Sigrid so uh, uh, so this is good overall despite this Coriolis but this grid, uh, Coriolis, uh, this is not really true uh, in the ocean. So, not good grid for ocean. Why? Because in ocean, Rossby radius is extremely small. As Rossby is small there. So Rossby radius is small, it's just in the order of say 10 kilometers or so. So you, if you have a grid spacing of about one, uh, I don't know, 10 kilometers in the ocean, it's considered to be very good uh, resolution of the global ocean, then uh, your Coriolis force is completely screwed up. Not completely screwed up, but uh, you averaging. So you actually, when you average, you remove these small waves uh, that affected by Coriolis force so your small waves stop seeing Coriolis force because you average them and as a result uh, but small waves can be actually on the same scale as Rossby so they start not seeing rotation so your small waves uh, these waves in the ocean that can be important uh, on these scales of a few like 10 kilometers or so they don't see rotation as a, uh, and that could be bad because those eddies in the ocean, small mass, so-called mesoscale eddies, they very small and they all because of the rotation, they feel actually rotation. Ocean uh, 
uh, feels rotation much more than atmosphere on, on much smaller scales because, well, it moves slower and it's uh, pretty heavy and dense. So, the, uh, but mostly because it doesn't move actually fast, so it have more time to actually feel, feel rotation. So small scales don't feel rotation. So that's why in the ocean, they don't use sea grid usually. So finally, um, we're going to consider a so-called uh, degrid. Degrid. So degrid is basically very similar to, uh, kind of uh, looks like sea grid, except that you and V are replaced. So uh, you have still H's in the middle of a cell. But now U, instead of being here, is actually on opposite side and V's are here now. So why, why, why would, why would you would do something like that? So you still need to uh, average so corner right away need averaging for Coriolis it's still the same but the nice property for this is uh, that it's actually very easy to implement uh, conditions quasi-geostrophic balance. Remember that balance between pressure gradient and Coriolis force. So for the ocean specifically, this is very important because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in the ocean uh, Rossby radius is very small. So uh, ocean is on at all scales basically even few kilometers is always in this kind of quasi-geostrophic balance. So it's very important um, uh, to enforce it. And quasi-geostrophic balance means that D, D, H, let's say for X component, D, H, D, X uh, equals to uh, F, V. So you see horizontal gradient of, gradient of H, of height, equals to V. So you see that in this case, dh dx computed in the same point as v so no averaging is involved so uh, uh, but uh, when you compute uh, uh, for velocity component u you still need averaging but because it's in quasi geostrophic it's not that big deal because anymore because uh, uh, your main equation has actually become something like that. Your time derivative here becomes kind of small because of the cause of geostrophy. So you see that, and for g d h d y equals to minus f u, this is a geostrophic rebalance for v component. So you see that d h d y equals to u f times u. So it's it's already there. So this is big pro. Good for quasi geostrophic strophic flows flows so used or popular in ocean models but it's uh, not good for atmospheric models because uh, for relatively high resolution atmospheric models because in atmospheric models our Rossby radius usually much bigger than the grid spacing. So uh, for us it's not a big deal, for us, for us conservation properties are more important and quasi geostrophic at small scales is not a big deal for us. So this is good for ocean, bad for atmosphere. So you see, uh, the point of, of today's lecture is that grid or arrangement of grid points does matter. It's not just, you know, a matter of aesthetics. It, there is a very big, uh, uh, there is very, very big reasons behind this arrangement. And some just depending on the arrangement, you can actually create much better solutions for your particular problem than with another, but it's all then with another grid uh, 
uh, arrangement, but it's all uh, uh, depends on problem that you're talking about. So for certain problems, certain grids are great. For other problems, other grids are great. For atmosphere generally, the most acceptable grid right now, the most popular is C grid, and for the ocean, it's a uh, it's D grid, and also B grid. Uh, is also uh, kind of good for, uh, or considered to be good for the ocean because for big grid, Arakawa big grid, uh, you remember, Corollis force is computed directly without averaging. So for very high resolution ocean models, probably big grid is better than big grid because there is no averaging uh, of, uh, of uh, Corollis force and there is no averaging of pressure gradient force. Okay, see you next time.